Uh, we can move on to the next session. Uh, it's the skills and tools, toolkits for an ophthalmologist. So we'll move on to uh, the first talk, The Art of Draping of a Patient for Ocular Surgery by Dr. Rajiv Kusumaran. He needs no introduction. He is such a well-known person. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chairperson, Coordinator, Convener, everybody, for giving me this opportunity. And I request pin drop silence. Please be seated. You can discuss the previous session outside if you want. Is that okay? See, the art of draping is very, very important, whatever surgery you are going to do. There are different ways of draping, there are people, but ultimately sterility has to be attained as far as draping is concerned. So the art of draping is, I chose, a, is it play? Yeah, I chose a person like Shashikuma sir, he is the sterile person of KSOS, he is doing it. See the, what you have noticed now is, that uh, staff, staff is pouring a, a povidone ident in the separate trolley meant for draping. Don't ever keep the uh, draping material along with your surgical items. That's what is important. What is wrong in this, she is crossing a hand onto the surgical. That should not be done. The surgeon should hold the cup outside the surgical field and then keep it there and do it. That's a wrong. Actually, this method is wrong. Adequate quantity of povidone iodine should be used for draping. And after installing a drop of uh, xylocaine, the eye is draped with adequate quantity. And it, uh, the draping should be from the center to the periphery. Once you go to the periphery, don't come back to the center. You can, this is the original sound in the theater itself. The patient is being monitored. Keep an ears also open with that sound, what is going on when you are draping itself, because you will know how the patient is going to react when the surgery is going to start. Then, cutting lash, whether to cut the lash or not, there are several studies says there is no added advantage. So the lid, the eyelashes, everything should be wiped. And this, the first drape comes with a double drape. One inner, one outer. Once you hold it, drop the outer outside. Assisted by the staff nurse or somebody in the theatre to drape. And you can have this uh, stand in front so that it, the patient's uh, nose is not pressed when you are draping. Uh, something like this is quite, quite helpful. It, this is, this, these steps should be meticulously followed. All the juniors who are sitting here you are starting a surgery, whatever good surgery you do, if you go wrong in this step, end up with an infection, you are going to be sued. Days of litigation open. Now wipe clean. Uh, this is done after three minutes, not immediately. The povidone iodine works as a bactericidal only if it is in contact for three minutes. This is isolating the lashes using tape, sterile tapes are available. It's not necessary, there are other methods also, but you can isolate the lashes, but this is one of the method that can be followed. This will totally isolate the lashes away from the surgical field.
apply some gel if it can be xylocaine gel or or uh, visco itself is enough so that the drape what you are going to stick doesn't stick to the cornea see this i am showing a small drape you can use a larger tape if you want and keep the eye open when you are sticking the drape and try to open from the medial aspect don't try to open up from the lateral side then put the speculum different types of speculums are available in the market whichever is comfortable to you after several use you will know what uh, type of this is a screw type where you can ideal for a topical surgery and make sure there is no pressure on to the globe see now i am showing you that gap there you can see that gap here see the lid is so lifted up absolutely there is no pressure onto the globe so this is the best way of doing uh, there are different ways i don't say the best one of the best way of draping and this something what i saw nakamura's uh, speculum in the peer reviewed uh, journal looks very interesting for me you know i so i thought i'll show you i can share this experience with you it's supposed to be a disposable uh, speculum shape is something like this and uh, the diameter is about 5 uh, 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 cm all together you can insert it into the eye and i mean in, uh, below the lids and uh, this is uh, this particular video has won an award in uh, one of the international conferences see this uh, it doesn't make any difference between a temporal or a superior incision what type of surgery whatever it is even a vitrectomy vitreous surgery can be done with this speculum the advantage is 100% the lashes will be isolated that's so the take home message is Povidone iodine should be used for draping and it should be done for at least 3 minutes leave it and the lashes should be isolated from the uh, uh, surgical side and use a different trolley for draping don't combine it with your regular even intravitreal you can give using this speculum is that fine i finished 1 minute in advance thank you thank you sir that was an excellent presentation by dr rajiv sir uh, especially for the juniors i would like to you know you can never underestimate the importance of a proper draping technique especially being a vr surgeon what happens is during our graduation the only thing we are concerned is with cutting like you, the moment you are you don't we are not worried worried about uh, what's happening before the surgery the moment you get to sit on the surgery start surgery what what happens is especially if the proper draping technique is not used especially uh, being a vr surgeon but we have very close working angle uh, distance with the biome it starts fogging and if you can't see properly you will end up you know creating more complications in surgery so draping is ex very very important so i would just like one question uh, would you do you have any per particular tips to you know provide like especially when you cut the drapes uh, what we have noticed is if we keep a too much of angle over there then it starts uh, fogging the, the biome system especially starts fogging so do you have any particular tips that you could share with everyone uh, that is it is fogging because your ventilation system in the theater is not proper the proper hipa system or the air handling unit the entry should be from right above the patient said or the surgeon said come down and the air flow should be laterally then there will not be fog fog comes when the air from the patients are or something lifts up from the not surgery. not in the cataract surgery but especially no, uh, for that what you should do is uh, before they start the drape uh, nowadays uh, we give in my theater i use the mask for the patient also so just with the mask you tape the whole mask so nothing happens you know you don't get the fog and uh, what i do is uh, the pediatric uh, feeding tube is there no yeah. i put it on the side yeah, and yeah. connect through, oxygen through, to through the uh, mask you can and underneath yeah. the mask and the other thing one more thing that we used to we never cut it straight we cut it slightly angulated yeah. to the yeah, yeah. side that's I, i'm sorry for uh, asking you to be quiet uh, sorry thank you sir next is uh, toric marking on slit lamp 
by Dr. Prabhu Shankar. Over to you, sir. So, toric marking, uh, we use it only for when you are uh, asking medicine around more than one. Initially, what we used to do is when the uh, slitlam marking is not done, we had this three prong marking. So, what you do is with your marker pen, you mark these three areas. And after applying the paracane drops for the patient, the patient has to sit on a couch with the head rested against the wall. So, your axis will be perfect. You shouldn't do this in lying position, okay? It has to be done only in the sitting posture. And you mark three axes the 0, 90, and the 180, okay? So, you have three markings here. So, these markings will help you in when you are operating to show which is the 80 and the 180 and the 90 degrees so that you can mark. So, this is, only, this is without using the slit lamp. Earlier we used to do this technique. Now we have shifted over only to the slit lamp marking. It's very easy. So, all, this, all the regular slit lamps, you have this marking there in the uh, slit lamp. So, just you can rotate whichever axis you want. Usually it's kept at 90 degrees for us to use it for slit lamp. For the toric, you need to see, confirm which axis, that's the, which is the steep axis. So steep axis has to be marked and directly you make a small slit, center it over to the center of the cornea. Ideally it has to bisect the center of the eye, okay? So that if you move up and down beyond the visual axis, you will get up the wrong axis and very difficult to center the uh, markings with the lens. So ideally, now what I have done is, now I, I mark it before I dilate the pupil now. So before dilatation, the pupil is centered now, so I rest, bisect the pupil and mark. So post dilatation, you don't have to di uh, do the marking again. So the lens perfectly matches the, your IOL marking. Your IOL marking and the marking on the cornea marks uh, goes very parallel. Only thing is, if pupil is dilated and if you don't center to the center of the eye, on table, your IO never gets in alignment with uh, your toric marking. So the easiest trick is mark it when the pupil is not dilated. So you can bisect the pupil, get the axis tight. Invariably, your uh, toric marking will be very good. The easiest way. And you have all these new microscopes having this image-based uh, system and very expensive, which is actually not necessary. We get very good results. Thanks. Thank you, Manu. Any comments on that, Rajiv, sir? Actually, that is the best way of doing it uh, because, but the only thing what I do is when I s ask them to l look at a distance, otherwise when you uh, ask them yes, to uh, yes. look at you, no, they convert, there's intortion coming yeah, in. That's what exactly when I do. You'll have to look straight. No, I don't ask them, I don't make them sit in the slit lamp. He's a meteor retinal surgeon, yeah. <laughs> just, just spare him. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I just uh, ask them to sit, uh, just before entering the theater, I ask them to sit on a chair and uh, ask, ask one sister to hold the uh, torch a little bit away. So ask them to focus on that. And then from my side, I just go open the eyes and then just do the marking like 180 degrees on both, zero and 180 degree. Mostly I think in the sitting posture, we don't have this uh, torsion problem. No, we don't so Initially, we, we, sometimes uh, they don't mark and the patient comes on table, then they say it's toric I know. And very difficult to shift the patient outside. I know. So yeah. I have done it on lying posture invariably. No, I have done it. 10 degrees off. Yeah, off I have axis. done it inside the OT also. Yeah. Because sometimes the patient don't come on time. So uh, we have already scrubbed. So only so thing is when it's around 180 degrees without marking, sometimes if you're lucky, you can get away. Yeah. So directly, you know, you can align with the microscope. Uh, yes. If you use high-end microscopes, you can center to the center of the... Uh, mm -hmm. reflecting light, uh, red reflex light and you can center it. But ideally it has to be marked only in sitting posture. Sitting posture, yeah. yes. That will be the, uh, that will no, be avoid yeah. intortions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, the best. Thank you, madam. Any questions? Uh, excellent talk. Next, uh, I call up Dr. Sanjeev Pesh. He'll be talking about corneal foreign body rustering removal. So, we'll be moving on to something less glamorous now. Uh, so, this is something we all do. It's, we see it every day. It's there. I mean, it's nothing, no, to, no great shakes about it. So, you have your iron foreign bodies. It's just basically superheated metal in most cases. So, it is most likely to be sterile. Although, if you do get an infection, it's most likely going to be either bacillus or pseudomonas, which is of the worst kind. 
The rust ring, of course, is nothing more than the oxidation product that you get around it. Now, the way I look at it, when I look at a foreign body, this is how I classify it. So you have a foreign body that's inert, or you can have it associated with an infiltrate. You can even have sterile keratitis around the foreign body, or just sometimes just a plain corneal concussion injury, which is either thermal or from the impact of the foreign body itself. This is the first kind. This is inert. So you see there's just a you know, little bit of scarring around it, but otherwise the eye is quiet. So you just pull it off with a 30 gauge needle and it comes off in toto. There's no remnant left behind. This on the other hand is both a sterile as well as an infective keratitis that you see there. Now, these foreign bodies will never come out in toto. You will always have it come out piecemeal. You will have remnants left behind and the tissue surrounding that foreign body area is infected, is swollen and will always tend to get macerated as you try to pull the rust ring out. Now in these cases, it's best to just leave it alone. Whatever you can get without scarring the cornea, you take it out and the rest you let it be. You can always come back in and go back to fight another day. This is of course infective, no doubt about it. You see the large epi defects surrounding it. This you remove the foreign body, you can culture the foreign body as well, but most likely you also have to treat the infection. This is the last kind. This is a concussion injury. Now you see those lines around the striae that you get almost like SK. So this is basically a concussion injury from either from the thermal or the impact of the foreign body. Now these foreign bodies will come out in one piece, but you will have a small rim. I don't know it's, if it's very visible here, but you will see a small rim of rust around. Usually this is inert. You don't actually have to go back in and take it. Most definitely not in the first sitting, because if you do, you will actually macerate the tissue and you will end up causing corneal scarring at that point. This is the last kind. Now, this is an intracorneal foreign body, but it's basically not in the anterior chamber. We have done an ASOC to confirm it, but I'm just showing this for completion's sake. Now, if you have an intracorneal foreign body that is not penetrated, but is very deep, you don't actually use the same tract as it went in. You, don't, you never use the same tract. You basically create a tract that's parallel and tangential to it. After that, it's like doing a dalk. You basically have to slowly cut down you keep making nicks because there will be a bit of stromal fibrosis. There will also be epithelial downgrowth, which would have made it sort of encysted in like within like a cocoon almost. So you basically be slow. You take your time. You make sure the foreign body is entirely free of any adhesions. Now, if you note, if you can see underneath the foreign body, there's a white shiny membrane. That's basically the desmes. So you got to be very careful while trying to lift it up because if you're too forceful, you might actually puncture through. Then once you're sure the foreign body is no longer, you know, attached anywhere, you lift it out. So this is basically the lead of a pencil in a child. You, these cases you have to suture to close. You cannot leave it alone. So this is the first suture. Now it is very tight, but this is just a corneal stay suture. You put it as tight as possible to make the edges of the wound come closer together. You then put two other sutures at optimum tension. And the final suture, the stay suture that you put initially, you cut. You then pull through like so, it takes a while, and then you can make the final suturing to the optimum tension. And at the end of it all, you can probably even use a qualitative keratometer like so to make sure you don't have, any, you've not induced any astigmatism. You put a BCL on it to let it heal. Now while coming to removing foreign bodies, these are the tools of the trade. If it's superficial, you can just use a cotton bud, wipe it off. This is what I use on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a 30 gauge insulin syringe with a bevel. It's very atraumatic, it works extremely well. You can also use this. This is a foreign body spud, which is available from most uh, surgicals. And the last thing, if you have a rust ring at the end of it all, you can use this. This is an algebra brush. It's basically a diamond burr, which you can use to polish the rust ring off without causing too much tissue damage. Post removal, obviously you keep them on broad spectrum cover. You give them a bland ointment. You give them surface lubrication. The less viscous the lubricant, the better. You don't have to use trehalose. You don't have to use hyaluronate. Because using them in higher quantities actually just causes everything to get trapped inside and the toxicity from that actually makes it get infected in the, in the long run. Cycloplegics you can give as needed. Steroids I usually do not give unless I've used a diamond burr wherein I've caused some amount of sterile keratitis by my doing. Finally, when you're removing a, contact, when you're removing a foreign body, you make sure you anesthetize the patient well. You can have them sit outside your consultation chamber for about five minutes, have them apply paracaine two or three times. Make sure they're well calmed down before they come in. Adjust the slit lamp illumination to optimum. Make sure it's not too bright because they already have enough photophobia as it is. You make sure you and the patient are positioned optimally. Use a soft touch and like I said, do not macerate the tissue. And most importantly, know when to stop. If it's not coming out, you don't actually have to go at it aggressively and poking at the rust ring trying to pull it out in the first sitting. You can wait and stagger your approach and remove the rust remnants later on. 
as like I mentioned before and earlier, please make sure you follow them closely for the first 24 to 48 hours as that is when you can have an infection as well. With that, I'll finish. Thank you so much. So that was an excellent uh, topic, sir. I have a question that where you, you used to review the cases every after 24 hours? Uh, yes, ma'am. So if you've removed a foreign body, you see them the, in the first 24 hours. You see them the next day, then you see them on the third day. After that, you're, after that it's fine. You can give them long follow-ups. So in the first uh, this one, if you leave a little bit of ring of that rust ring. Yes, <coughs> yes. Then the oh, you mean the you mean the removing the, the rust ring? The small one then the periphery you will have, no? Yes, Which yes. Which you told it's like better not uh, to give in the two. So that there's no fixed number for that. So basically, I showed you that image which had that edema around it. Yeah. You will notice that removing the rust ring is most difficult when the cornea is edematous. Yes. So you wait for the edema to settle down. The moment the cornea becomes compact in that area, you can remove it very easily. Okay. With a needle or a diamond burr, that's up to you. Okay. Depends on what you have access to. And sometimes when the patients used to come after that, they may not remove the rust ring, it will be there itself. And you can see the periphery, it's like uh, the full... Uh, how do you manage that one, sir? You, you like, it, like it would have started, rest, uh, the scarring would have happened. Kind correct, of. correct, yes. And the patient main complaints is uh, the vision is blurred. Yes, because basically the rust ring does induce a component of keratitis. So you have, so, and if it, you're asking if it's epithelialized or no, no, after no, it's no, epithelialized? No, no, it is not epithelialized. It's not epithelial. Yeah, so you go back, so there's two options. You, you need to debride it again. The yes, quality? yes, exactly. So you look at it on the slit lamp. Now, if it is superficial, because the rust ring will never epithelialize completely, you will yes, see a mound. That, that, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So if you see that mound and you see the con cornea is actually compact, there's no edema at all, you can actually just use a needle and lift. You can actually get it in two segments or three segments. It will come out, you know, big, big chunks. Yes. But if you feel there's too much, there's still edema, you can wait. There's no harm. You can wait for another 24, you can even another wait for it 48 hours. You can keep them on, you know, give them symptomatic treatment. And, and then you can go back in and take it. How early you give? Which one, ma'am? Antibiotics. How frequently? No, no, not required. Not at all. Not no. Six times a day, maximum. Yep. You patch it depends. It regularly? Patch? No, not at all. No. You, you shouldn't actually patch any. In fact, even traumatic defects, there's actually no reason to patch. And what about the cyclopagics? Every cases you give cyclopagic? Yeah, it depends. If you see an AC reaction, if there's iritis, yes. Like the last case which you showed, where there is a stri. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And the starting of the, you had put a BCL in that corneal uh, tear. Yes, tarot. yes, yes. So you start the medication right away. Absolutely, yes. It's and a clean case otherwise, right? Yes. And uh, do you uh, send the sample for culture? In this the, case, no. The, no, the no, foreign body? No, not at all. No, because it's otherwise clean. Thank you. There was a nice talk by uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, next, I... Just a point more, foreign body removal, there are people uh, uh, who go in for syncopal attack. Just keep a watch on them when you are taking it. Just feel the pulse. If the pulse is slowing down, just wait until you remove and then... They even get epileptic attacks. So, uh, next I call upon Dr. B.G. John. He'll be talking about indirect ophthalmoscopy and slit lamp biomicroscopy. Very good afternoon to all. Thank you to Jay Person for inv involving me in this uh, course. So, these are two very important basic examinations as far as the retina is concerned. One is the lamp fund of the examination using either the 78D or the 90D, and second is the indirect ophthalmoscopy. So, uh, so regarding the uh, 78D or 90D examination, the choice of the lens is depending upon the personal preference. General retinal surgeons would prefer probably the 78D. Glaucoma people will prefer 90D. Then uh, the sit lamp settings generally, uh, the magnification is set at uh, 10 if you have got a stepwise magnification like uh, as that is shown here. Then you set the beam width to about uh, 3 to 5 millimeters. And next, the beam height is adjusted here to 5 millimeter. And the alignment, alignment should be coaxial. So make it coaxial like this. And now, you can ask this patient to be seated. The patient should be comfortable. You adjust everything. Uh, you make the candle alignment correct. And now you can see the bond the beam is coaxial. It will appear like this, bisecting the pupil. Then uh, you, this is your view at, the, at, the, at that time. 
And having got this sort of a reflex, then you can move the sweat lamp slightly backwards. And uh, then you can introduce the lens about 8 millimeters from the patient's eye, like this. So this is how you hold the lens between the uh, tip of the index finger and the ball of the thumb. Uh, this is the position of the other fingers. So other fingers would, of the surgeon would help to stabilize the lens there. You can see how the three fingers are resting on the head strap. And uh, now you ask the patient generally to look at your opposite ear because that will help to bring the optic disc to focus so that directly you can see on the lens. And this is the initial view through the lens. You can see that the eye will be seen upside down. Okay, and now you adjust the lens to get a good reflex and slowly move the street lamp forwards without losing the view. Again, adjust the lens a little more so that you can, you can now things will get focused and uh, street lamp also is adjusted slightly. And now this is what is going to happen. This is the view of the uh, macula and you can see the optic disc there. And with a slight movement, you can bring the fovea also into the focus. So you can either use this method or you can have a systematic examination like this, starting from the optic disc and widening the beam and uh, then going in a systematic way along the arcades, the other arcades, it's a case of diabetic retinopathy, and finally only coming to the fovea because that will keep the pupil dilated and the patient also comfortable. Okay. So now about the uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy. Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, uh, cannot waste much time for the optic, but generally, you know, you can have, have an uh, image of the retina which goes to the infinity when the beam of the indirect falls on the retina, the image will be generally obtained on the infinity. So you insert a lens and uh, the image is now focused at the focal lens of the condensing lens. It will be laterally reversed and uh, vertically inverted. And uh, for the juniors, you know, before you embark upon this journey of learning the indirect ophthalmoscopy, it is very important that you learn how to hold the lens properly because the, how you move from one part of the fundus depends entirely upon this. So as you can see here, the lens is held between the tip of the index finger and the ball of the thumb. And the middle finger is what helps to stabilize it. So it is the fulcrum upon which the lens is going to move. And then you practice these movements outside, you know, the, by the flexion of the thumb and the index finger, you bring the lens up and down. So this is going to help you bring the fundus exactly into focus. And once that is done, then you also need to practice this movement by tilting the lens to side and side, so that this is how it will help you to move from one part of the fundus to the other. So having learned this, now it is time to go to the patient. You know, adjusting the lens, you need to spend sufficient time for adjustment of the indirect ophthalmoscope. You need to adjust the, uh, the, the crown band first and then the headband because many people do it the reverse way which will help, uh, which will result in a lot of discomfort to the surgeon. So this is the proper way. And then you need to uh, focus it, adjust it by looking at your thumbnail which is held about 18 to 20 inches, the outstretched hand that everybody does. And you need to uh, do it uh, with the, bring the, bring the eyepiece, adjust the eyepiece so that uh, you see a single round and the thumb at the center of the, uh, that, that, that round. So you need to do it separately for each oculars and finally make sure that you have a single view like this. And when you switch on the beam of the light, the beam of light will be somewhat like this. This beam has to be adjusted again. When you have got an indirect ophthalmoscope where the beam can be separately adjusted, you adjust it so that it is brought to the center of that circle. So now you are ready. Okay, so all these things, you know, well-dilated pupils, patient comfort, correct working distance, all these are very important. Line should be dimmed, and this is how you start. It's better to st uh, learn to use your writing hand for the scleral depressor and the other hand, that is the non-dominant hand for the lens. If it is uh, difficult, uh, you can do the other way also. And uh, you can see what the dominant hand is using, uh, doing here. The thumb is actually moving the other lid. Uh, and is also resting so that the lids are kept open. And uh, the lens is held using the, uh, the type of grip that I have already told you and the middle finger is actually resting on the uh, slight distance away from the lower lid. And uh, now if you introduce the lens about one inch from the patient's eye 
and is slowly lifted upward. Then at a particular point, you can see the lens filling with that beautiful image of the uh, retina. Now the problem is that once you get this image, initially it is a little, little difficult to make sure that the image uh, stays like that. So that requires some practice. So uh, let us say, okay, and uh, once you know how to have that image of the lens steady in the lens, the next thing to learn is to how to move from one part of the lens to the one part of the retina to the other. For this, this particular principle, that is the uh, principle of that uh, optical bench, that here the observer's macula, you can see the eyepiece, uh, center of the eyepiece, then the center of the condensing lens, the patient's pupil, the object observed on the fundus, all these elements are to be kept on a rigid axis. You can see that uh, green dotted line that there. So this axis has always to be kept in a straight line. All these elements has to be in this axis, which means that when you move from one part to the another, you have to move the entire thing. You need to move your torso so that all these elements are still in that particular line. So only then you will be able to keep that image there and uh, view the uh, the, the retina correctly. So this is referred to as sweeping of the fundus. This is how you should move from one part of the retina to another. So it is imperative that you practice it anywhere, it first. So this is actually the view, you know, this is what you are viewing. You can see the, the, the light of the light of the sun falling there and this is the image, image that you are seeing on the lens. So now, when you are beginning, you should first, you know, go to the posterior pole like this, get the optic disc and the fundus and the macula in one view. So you pick up one uh, vessel and uh, slowly move to the equator. You can see here you are, you are going along the supratemporal vessel, it's going up to the periphery. So this should be done in the fundus sweeping maneuver that we already described. So without uh, just moving your torso. And once you have reached the equator, then you should come back. You should again follow and come back to the optic disc. So this is again sweeping. So you need to practice this quite a few times before you are comfortable. So now you pick up the other vessel, go along that. So as you can see, you can see how the image in the lens also moves. So the image which is closer to you is the periphery, the image which is away from the, you to the center. So you just practice this quite a few times till you are comfortable with the sweeping of the fundus. So this maneuver alone will help you to see the posterior pole in its entire, entirely. So once you have got ma mastered then, then you can go to the periphery and uh, then you think about the inverted image also, then that brings us to the important topic of the fundus drawing. You cannot do learn indirect ophthalmoscopy without simultaneously learning how to draw on a proper uh, fundus chart. So the, it is the process of the sketching of the indirect ophthalmoscopy that is going to help you learn. So this is the this is the chart, the Amsler Du Bois chart that you can see, which we use for charting the retina. So you can see that uh, we already marked that that the, the, that the aura serrata. You can see the three rings. The innermost ring is the equator. Then the second ring is the aura serrata. The third one points the region of the ciliary process. You mark the aura serrata there. You also mark the optic disc and the fovea. So this is the retina that we are going to examine. So you ch turn the chart uh, upside down. So now you can see that the 12 o'clock of the chart is placed towards the 6 o'clock of the patient. And once this is done, now the image of the lens is going to correspond exactly of that the drawing chart. And now you can just draw without thinking about whether it's superior, inferior, temporal, etc. So this is now the lens coming. So the posterior pole you can see it is drawn. What is seen in the lens is drawn entirely as what you see on the fundus chart. And now how to go to the periphery? So let us say we are going to examine the one o'clock. So you go move to the exactly at 180 degree away from the one o'clock. So when you move here and you look across the one o'clock, you can see what is happening in the chart here. No? The portion of the chart is exactly, the one o'clock now is almost near you and whatever you draw, you can just draw to the portion of the chart near to you because that uh, one o'clock portion has come here. And again, whatever you see on the lens, you have just copied there exactly as what you see. Now, if you go to, want to go a little more periphery, you need to do a little more maneuver. You need to ask the patient to slightly look away towards the one o'clock, like this. So the, the patient's eye moves a little towards the one o'clock, and now you can see the periphery also coming there, and that also, part also is charted there. Whatever you see, whatever the image that you see in the lens is charted on the fundus picture, I mean fundus chart exactly as you see. 
and don't worry about all this uh, inversion and all this at this time. So likewise, you go all around. So that is why you need to have the patient supine when you do this. Only then you will be able to move around uh, and uh, do the fundus charting at all the clock awaits. So now you are done whatever initially we have seen in all the four clock awaits and the drawing is complete. So now if you will reinvert the fundus picture, now we have got an exact replica of what you have seen there on the fundus chart. And you can see that whole everything is correct. Now just do these drawings, keep on doing this and within no time you will become an expert in that of thalmoscopy. Okay, I think I'm, uh, the time is over. If thing, I will stop here. I mean, I just meant. Okay. This is something they should really understand. Okay, Please continue. Okay, okay. Then I will take a little more time and uh, just um, 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 uh, speak about this thing also. It's clear depression. Because generally, initially, we just stop with this thing because uh, it's for the first years, you know, when, when the PGs come. The scleral depression, generally, we advise that you take up, I mean, after the first year, initially, when you are, when you are comfortable with all the other things. But it is essential, it is essential to see the part of the retina anterior to the equator. It actually allows the observer to palpate the retina and to examine critically the equatorial region and anterior to it. So how to do that? Again, uh, so this is how. When you, when, you, when you start, I think you should uh, probably initially start on the uh, superior part because the superior uh, half is easier to depress. So let us see, this is the depressor which is coming and you ask the patient to look down and the depressor goes and positions itself. No, you have to position it, I mean, on the upper edge of the tarsus like this. And now, again, you ask the patient to look away, look up. So when the eye is moving out, your, your depressor also moves along with that. So that now the depressor positions in that area which you are going to depress. Now you can apply slight pressure. The, rather than the pressure, it is the position which is important. So once you have got this thing, you can bring the indirect. Even without the lens, you should be able to see that black mount there. And then you can uh, uh, introduce the indirect lens. Again, you should uh, be very careful about this principle of that straight line. All those elements that you're going to see should come in that line. Only then you will be able to see that. Okay, so come to the actual process. So this is how that depressed mount will be actually appearing. So this is how the lens is coming. This is what actually happens. You can see you are not seeing any depression there. So this is initially what is happening. Why are you not seeing, able to see the depression? Now that is because you can see where the light is falling. In that area where the light is falling, still the depressed area is still peripheral to that. You are not focusing on that area. So how do you get to the area? So either you need to move a little more back, bend your knees, so that the mount appears. It is still peripheral. Now you can see it appearing from the periphery. Okay. Now, you know, now you can actually move the depressor also, sli slide it inwards, and you can see the depressed area just appearing like that. So it is position that is important and that area should come at the, at the, at the focus and so that should come in the straight line. So if you are not getting initially, it means that it is maybe it is still peripheral. So you need to adjust your, your view like that. Now you, you have got a, uh, something around there, you are not very sure whether that is a break or a uh, hemorrhage. So you need to find out. So again, this is another problem. Now this is your intention. Your intention is to move from that area to uh, in the direction, but because in the indirect it is reversed, what you will end up move, doing is this. This will be your initial direction. So you will go like that. Okay. So th this is because you are not very comfortable initially with the inversion. So in, then you will find out that it is no. You need, you need to reverse. You need to go in the other direction. And now once you know that this is how it will appear. Now you will know that uh, you can see that edges and you will surely know that now it's a break and not a the hole. So this is about palpating the retina. Okay, I think I will stop here. So mastering indirect ophthalmoscopy, it is not practice basically, only perfect practice is going to make you perfect. Thank you. Very nice. I think even all of us also, uh, also got some information. It's really, I think uh, the juniors uh, should learn a lot of t tips from this uh, presentation. Thank you, Vichu, for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent uh, talk, sir. Next, I call upon Dr. Kaushik Murli. He'll be talking about FTT and FGT.
Thank you so much. I think it's humbling to see a hall this full uh, in a post-lunch session. Uh, thank you so much, PGs, for showing interest, uh, the residents, and even some very senior teachers who are here as a part of the audience. Uh, FDT, FD, FGT is a tool for an ophthalmologist. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Vidya, Dr. Saumya, and Dr. Divya, who helped me with some of the videos for this presentation. Uh, when we talk of the force duction test, largely it is imperative that we do this in an incompetent squint. It helps us differentiate broadly between a paralytic or a neurogenic squint and a restrictive or a mechanical squint. So if the ocular movements are full, you will not do an FDT. It is indicated only when a limitation is noted. And in a patient with limitation, this should be done at some stage before the actual surgery is performed. So the first step in this is anesthesia. So you would do it in topical anesthesia in an adult, so you see that happening. Sometimes you can augment it by putting a little cotton pledget that is uh, soaked in anesthetic and you place it near the region where you're going to do. In children, it is largely done under general anesthesia because you're going to be tugging the eyeball around and it can cause a lot of discomfort. And again, in patients with aberrant regeneration, you would need to do it under general anesthesia. Otherwise, you're going to get readings that may not be very, very appropriate. So before the anesthesia is applied, of course, you need to get your tools ready. By and large, for these tests, you don't need anything very fancy. You need an anesthetic drop. You need a couple of forceps, tooth forceps or Hoskins or any other forceps that is available. And you may need a couple of Q-tips that can help you in getting it done. You can also augment this or make it easier for you to see by using a drop of phenylephrine. So that kind of decongests the eye. And what you see as a red eye on the left becomes pretty blanched out and easy for you to understand the landmarks and where you're grasping once you apply this anesthetic. What is the methodology? So first and foremost, like I mentioned, you establish a limitation. You know that the patient is unable to move his eyeball. In this, I've shown a case of probably a right LR palsy where you want to see what is happening. And you assume that because of the long-standing palsy, there is a restriction around where the medial rectus is. So here, if there is a neurogenic element and you move the eyeball out, passively you move it out, following Sherrington's law, the medial rectus should not interfere and you should be able to roll the eyeball very easily. So here, the clinician is assisting the movement. Now, this is where it starts getting tricky, saying that what do you mean by a clinician assisting movement? So here, I've just depicted, I've requested a couple of our staff to volunteer. So here, you can see they're generally just pulling it in the direction of movement. So if it is a lateral rectus, you may hold the forceps at the medial rectus and you passively move it where the eye is supposed to abduct. So that is what you're doing essentially in an FDT test. So this again is a short video. This can be done in the outpatient clinic. You could also do it in the operation theatre. You have anesthetized the eye and you hold it at the limbus where you have the conjunctiva and the tenons. And then you are trying to passively move the eyeball in the direction where you want to determine whether there is any restriction. So you move it direction opposite to where the restriction is. This typically will give you a hold or you will feel a mechanical restriction in majority of cases. Very, very rarely, you can have a reverse leash effect. I don't think it is very critical for you to know this, uh, at least when you're answering your PG exam, where in the direction of movement itself, sometimes you can find a restriction happening. But by and large, you hold it at the limbus. Why you hold it there? Again, mechanically, you're less likely to tear the conjunctiva if you're holding it a little beyond, or if you're holding it at the tendon, it can again be very painful to the patient. It's not just the forceps. In some patients, you can even use a Q-tip to kind of roll the eyeball around. The disadvantage of doing this is inadvertently you are likely to press the eyeball down. This again becomes a very favorite question of the examiner saying what happens. The minute the eyeball is retropulsed in, it causes some, some amount of laxity of the muscle and again you end up getting erroneous kind of a reading. When should you retropulse? We will come to that as a video a little shorter time. So again, you need to be clear which muscle you are testing. So when you're holding it there, you're holding the medial rectus and rotating the eyeball in the direction of the lateral rectus. You can do that again in the direction where you are trying to test the medial rectus, holding it uh, at the nine o'clock position. You can test for infraduction restriction by holding it at the superior rectus and rolling the eyeball down. Or you can look for infraduction restriction by 
rolling the eyeball up. So you can be very clear that all muscles, all the recti can be very easily examined by doing the force duction test. Like Sir mentioned earlier, you should be wary of syncopal attacks because you are handling the eyeball, so it's better done. It is always done with the patient lying down so that you're not worried about it. If you can hook up a monitor, that is even better. Uh, it's not just one forceps. Some, most of us prefer using two forceps because that way you can actually proptose the eyeball a little bit out and you're not worried about tearing the conjunctiva out. So again, you hold it at perpendicular to the direction where you want to move the eyeball or roll the eyeball and then it's very easy for you to get this done. So your control is much, much better when you're using two forceps. When you're doing this, there is a technique called as the force duction test uh, described by Guyton, where you actually hold the eyeball at a three or a nine o'clock. Here I've tried to demonstrate the superior oblique. You retropulse the globe, you extort it and bring it superior nasally, and you kind of roll it temporarily to and fro, to, and you feel a kind of a tick or a tauntness. This actually takes a little time for you to get used to it. So wherever you're assisting a squint surgery, especially in post-retinal surgeries where buckling has been done, not a bad idea for you to try this out just to feel how the eyeball moves. So that familiarity will really, really help you. So in an FDT, if there is a free movement, it is FDT negative. It is more likely to be neurogenic. If the FDT shows resistance, then we document it on the case sheet as FDT positive. That is indicative of a mechanical restriction. Now that you've done the FDT, you know there is a mechanical restriction or probably you know that there is neurogenic. You want to know saying, does the muscle have any potential action? That is where you do what is called as the FGT test. So the FGT test is to understand the potential of the muscle. For this, you need a conscious and a cooperative patient. Here the difference is you see the person pulling away. So you ask the person to pull in the direction or look in the direction of the movement of the eyeball and you try to understand saying is there a po potential movement possible. The schematic is from the Orbis website. Do look it up. It's very simple for you to understand. So again, in a lateral rectus palsy, you would ask the patient to look towards the medial rectus or abduct the eye adduct the eye and then you ask, hold it there and ask the person to roll the eyeball out or abduct the eye out. So if you find a tug, again you know that the force generation test is positive. Again this is a very brief video just to show you what is happening. So here you hold the eyeball, ask the person to abduct the, adduct the eye and then once they have adducted the eye, you ask them to roll the eye out and then see where that is happening. What happens as a difference in an FDT, you're looking at restriction. You're trying to understand whether there is neurogenic or a mechanical restriction. In an FGT, you're trying to understand the potential of the muscle in terms of what capability it has. In an FDT, the examiner moves the eye and you look for restriction of movement. In an FGT, the examiner asks the patient to move the eye and you look for a force of movement. FDT is very passive and FGT is active. So very simplistically, this is what an FDT and an FGT is. I hope we have enticed some of you to start looking at strabismus. It's very simple as a specialization and look beyond the cataracts and the refractive surgery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So next I call upon Dr. Shweta. Uh, she'll be talking about calibration of apprehension and non-contact tonometer. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the scientific committee for giving me this opportunity to present in this uh, KSO session. Now, I am going to deal with the calibration of applanation tonometer. This is actually a very simple topic, but it is quite, uh, it, it is very important that we know this. So, uh, we know that uh, applanation tonometry is the uh, gold standard of the intraocular pressure measurement. And um, in a busy OPD setup, when we come continuously use the applanation tonometer, uh, we, with uh, months we know that uh, the, um, it, there can be some errors in the calibration. But uh, there was a study which was conducted in UK among the residents and it was found that 
less than um, only less than 15 percentage of the people knew how to calibrate an applanation tonometer and 85 percent of them told that they never do a calibration so even we know that there is a calibration rod but we never use it in our opd to calibrate the applanation so uh, we have two types of applanation tonometers okay sorry um, Sorry for that because my videos are not working in the other PowerPoint. So we have two types of applanation tonometers. This is a Zeiss model and uh, this is a Hack Street model of applanation tonometer. So we have the 8870 which can be uh, connected to a Zeiss model and 8900 that can be connected to a Hack Street model slit lamp. And uh, the procedure is intended to verify the accuracy of the instrument and it is not for calibration. It is just we can know whether it is working or not. So this is the Zeiss model applanation tonometer. For before calibration, we have to uh, place the prism downwards and there is a calibration rod that we get with each uh, applanation. So for the Zeiss model, we have a rod which has a, a holder along with it and the rod has uh, five markings in it. The center mark corresponds to zero. On either side, we have two and uh, on the sides, we have six. So two is corresponding to 20 millimeters of mercury, six corresponds to the 60 millimeters of mercury. And first, what we have to do is check at the drum position zero. For that, we have to uh, align the uh, mark to the center, the holder, it, uh, the index, it should be uh, to the center mark. And you have this holder which will go on to the, um, this position of uh, the applanation. And uh, after that, we have to move the um, recording, I mean the drum from zero. It has to slightly move uh, upwards and downwards. And the movement of the prism is checked. I'll show you in the next video. Checking at the drum position two. So you have to move this uh, uh, to the second position, number two. Tighten it and then uh, while connecting it to the Zeiss model uh, slit lamp, the longer arm, it should be towards the patient. So towards the patient and then, uh, so this should be towards the patient. So now move the dial from one to two. When you reach um, the position two, there will be a slight movement in the uh, prism. The feeler arm of the prism will move slightly forwards. So you can see that there is a slight forward movement. So then you go and check what is the reading. It should be at two or slightly above it, 0.5 or one millimeter is acceptable. So you, ch uh, you check at each position. So there is a positive error and there is a negative error. First thing we have to start from one and go and in increase it up to two. So it will fall forwards, then go backwards. From three you can go up and uh, two, um, you go backwards, then you will see that the, uh, the prism will move backwards. So whatever is the difference from the uh, reading, that will be the positive error and the negative error. Then we check with the drum position six. It is the same, uh, so at drum position six, you have to move from five to six. So that is corresponding to 60 millimeters of mercury. You just move it and wherever you get the movement, you can see the movement there. So that will be the reading which we have to take. Similar to that, you have the Hack Street model. This is the rod that we use in the Hack Street model. And uh, you can see that when you go from one to two, you can see in the right side, the movement of the prism slightly forwards. So similarly, you have to go backwards and see the movement slightly backwards. So this is in the position six. So when you go from five to six, you can see the movement of the rod. Either you can see the movement of the rod or you can see the movement of the prism. And this is to show that uh, the movement of the rod at uh, the position zero. So at position zero, even if you don't, uh, you don't need the calibration rod to check the position zero. Without the rod itself, you can check the uh, at zero position. So if you have any difference in error, you have to contact the company people 
So what is the tolerance level? The company has given us a tolerance level at 0 and 2 as plus or minus 0.5 millimeters of mercury and at 6 as plus or minus 1 millimeters of mercury. But we know that um, uh, we, when we try it out in our application, we know that it will be more than this. It can be 1 millimeters of mercury also. So, but uh, Southeast Asia Glaucoma Interest Group has given little more uh, larger area of and uh, for 0 millimeter it is 2 millimeters difference is acceptable. For the 20 plus or minus 3 is acceptable and for 60 plus or minus 4 is acceptable. But uh, all these uh, calibration errors when we are using the advanced patient, uh, using the application for the advanced patient it is important. Early and moderate glaucoma even if there is an error of 1 or 2 millimeters it is not going to affect uh, the treatment. So tonometers are most likely to show a positive calibration error. It will show overestimation of IOP. Whatever we are measuring will be higher. Now, how, how frequently should we do it? Manufacturers usually recommend monthly calibration. Now, coming to non-contact tonometry, as such, we don't do a calibration of non-contact tonometry. Uh, whenever we, we feel a difference between the non-contact and the applanation tonometer, we have to call the company people, and they are the ones who are doing it, because this they have an artificial uh, eye which has three slots and uh, this will be present with the company people. Uh, we may not have it at the hospital. And for this, uh, there is a low, mid and high. If you see the left hand side, there is a low, mid and high that is corresponding to the three uh, eye, uh, artificial eyes that they have given. And there will be a normal value there. When we are taking the tone uh, measurement, it has to correspond to whatever values they have given. So you can see that right hand side, the high value has actually come higher. So it has to be 36, but whatever measure was 56. So uh, then we will have to contact the people. So that uh, that's all about the uh, calibration. I hope you all start uh, using the calibration rods. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shweta. So I would like to the end of this time, so I would like to first of all thank all the presenters and all the audience who have even during the uh, post lunch session, they have all been here, uh, sitting here. And I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Deepa, Dr. Nudula and Dr. Lekha.